I'm Leif Walsh, and I'm going to talk about why the right read optimization is actually write optimization, and then what that means, and how you do it. So here's the situation, right? I have some data, and I want to learn things about the world, so I put it in MySQL, and I start querying it. And I learned some good things, um, but I want to learn more, so I go out and get more data. Everything's fine so far. Now I'm in a new situation. I have a lot of data. We're talking hundreds of gigabytes, maybe a terabyte. Uh, and my queries start to slow down drastically, and I can't run them all. I also happen to still be collecting data. We'll get to that. So my goal is to execute queries in real time against large, growing data sets. And to execute queries in real time, we need to do some read optimization. And we need to remember that these are large data sets and we're still inserting. Um, so let's talk about read optimizations. Here's a scenario where you can do read optimization with MySQL. So I have a table here. Uh, I have a key of A and I have columns B, C, D, and E. They're not indexed. And I have two different queries. On the right, I'm going to select values of D where E is in a certain range. And because MySQL hasn't stored my data sorted by E, it needs to do a full table scan and actually look at every single row in my database and pull out the values of D that it cares about and report those. On the left, my query is slightly different. I'm still selecting values of D, but this is when A is in a certain range. So because I have a key on A, this happens to be the primary key, because I have a key of A, the rows are sorted by, by the column A. So it can look just for this range in my index, and it examines only the rows where A is actually in the range I care about, and it can report those values of D. So this examines a lot less data. And so an index with the right key lets you examine less data, and that makes it faster. So this is a form of read optimization. There's another form of read optimization. And this is in the situation, in the following situation, where I have a key of A, this is my main dictionary, so primary key of A, I still have columns B, C, D, and E. But this time, I have a secondary index on B and a secondary index on C. However, selecting B and A, so I'm going to have a selection, a uh, select query, where I'm getting values of D, where B is in a certain range. So I have a secondary index on B, but in this case, selecting via an index can be slow if it's coupled with point queries. And the reason we have point queries is because I'm looking for the value D, and that's not in this secondary index. So while I can do a small range query on, this, on the secondary index, I still need to use the, the, the A column and go back to the main dictionary and do lots and lots of point queries to find the value that I want to report, which is D. So, Selecting via an index can be slow if it's coupled with point queries. And to fix this, we're going to use a covering index. So covering indexes can speed up queries. You may know about them. Uh, a covering index is where a key contains all columns necessary to answer the query. So now I have the same setup, except that this secondary dictionary here has a key that contains both B and D in it. So when I go and do the same query where I'm looking for values of D, with B in a certain range. I use the secondary dictionary here, and using the first column in the key, I can find the rows where B is in the range I care about. But then the values that I'm actually trying to report, the D, those are right there next to it. So I do one range query, and that's fast. And I don't need to go back and do a bunch of point queries. So there's no need to do point queries if you have a covering index. So these are two ways to do read optimization. Uh, both using indexes. So indexes do very good read optimization. Um, they can allow you to use the index instead of using a table scan, so you retrieve less data. Uh, you can do covering indexes instead of regular indexes and avoid those extra point queries. And uh, my colleague Zardash has a talk online called Understanding Indexing, where he goes very much in depth uh, in a non-storage engine dependent way about how you want to do indexing to do read optimization. Um, and 
there's another way where you can uh, avoid sorting after you get the data back out in certain cases, and there's a link to his talk. But the point is that queries run much pass faster with the proper indexes. So the right read optimization is actually good indexing. But when you have a table, you're going to want to run different queries on it. And different queries, depending on what form they take, are going to need different types of indexes. And so typically, if you have multiple query patterns for a table, you're going to need lots of indexes for a single table. And so optimizing reads with indexes is going to slow down insertions. And this is quite well known and commonly complained about. Um, so the, the, the case, so the right read optimization here is right optimization. And the reason for that is, the case for right optimization is indexed insertion performance. So uh, there was a MySQL bug that was filed, and I think it was marked not a bug, but uh, someone was complaining, I'm trying to create indexes on a table with 308 million rows. It took about 20 minutes to load the table, but 10 days to build indexes on it. And I'll talk about why that, that took so long. Uh, on uh, Peter's blog from Percona, uh, someone commented, select queries were slow until I added an index onto the timestamp field. So he's done read optimization with indexes. Adding the index really helped our reporting, but now the indexes are taking forever, or the, the inserts are taking forever. Um, so he needs read optimization now. And someone who isn't Lewis Carroll said, they index their tables, they index them well, and load did the queries run quick. But what, that wasn't the last of their troubles to tell. Their insertions, like molasses, ran thick. Um, so now our problem, so everyone knows you know, indexes slow down insertions. So our problem is to optimize the writes. So now we need to understand how writes work with indexes. So let's talk about B-trees. B-trees are the industry standard. They've been around since the 70s, since uh, I think the late 60s. Um, and they're used in, you know, DB and ExtraDB and everywhere. Uh, MongoDB even uses them. And so we should, we should talk a little bit about this. So on the left here, I have a B tree. On the right, I have another B tree. Um, and so B trees, it turns out, are very fast at sequential inserts. Now, when you're doing sequential inserts, the, the nodes along the right of the tree are going to be in memory. And so all the insertions, since you're doing them sequentially, are going to be in this rightmost leaf node. So sequential inserts in B-trees have what's called near-optimal data locality. So all of the nodes that you care about when you're inserting sequentially are going to be in memory. So you can just stick all your writes into that last leaf node and then push it out to disk. So you get one disk I.O. per leaf, but that contains many, many inserts. And so you're also doing sequential disk I.O., and that's good for disks. And so your performance is ba disk bandwidth limited. And that's good because disk bandwidth is really high. But B-trees are slow at ad hoc inserts. So when you're doing ad hoc inserts, which is where you're sort of doing inserts all over the table, and your inserts have high entropy, uh, you get poor data locality. So you'll have a bunch of internal nodes in memory, but when you have a large enough table, most of the leaves will not be in memory. And so most insertions are going to require random disk I.O. You're going to have to go somewhere to one of the leaf nodes that's not in, in memory. That'll be in a random location on disk. And you'll have to fetch that in, modify the leaf node, and then pretty soon you're going to have to write it out because you'll be reading in other leaf nodes all across the disk. So your performance is disk seek limited, and you can only do about 100 inserts per second per disk, because that's, the only, that's how many disk seeks you can do. It's uh, the, just very slow to move the disk arm. And this is an extremely small percentage of the disk bandwidth. So for this reason, good indexing is hard to do with B-trees. With multiple indexes, B-tree indexes are slow. So secondary indexes, which are what we want for read optimization, are not built sequentially. Sort of the, the intuitional reason for this is if they were built, being built sequentially, then they would have the same sort order as the primary key because they're being inserted in the same order. But if they had the same sort order as the primary key, why are you storing that secondary index? You may as well just use the primary index. 
Um, so secondary indexes are built are not built sequentially. They have very high entropy. Uh, not usually totally uniform, but we'll assume that. Um, so for read optimization, we want multiple secondary indexes for each table. And so each insert into a table becomes multiple random B tree insertions. So that's every time you, you insert one row, you do a whole bunch of random disk I.O. And that's very slow. So when you're using a B tree index, you can't keep up with incoming data rates that are very high. But of course, we can't run queries well without good indexes. And we can't keep good indexes in B trees. So what happens? So this is why the right read optimization is right optimization. When people run into this problem, they can't insert into a B tree fast enough. They, the first thing they do is they just stop using those indexes because they're saying, oh, my indexes are too slow. I'm just going to get rid of them. So they use a simplistic schema where they do sequential inserts via an auto, auto increment key. So now they don't have the indexes they need for all their queries. They have few indexes and few covering indexes, and those are even more expensive. And then, you know, their, their inserts are sequential, so insertions are fast, but their queries are slow. So adding sophisticated indexes helps queries, but B trees can't afford to maintain them. And so if we can speed up the inserts into a secondary key, we can maintain the right indexes, and therefore we can speed up queries. So this is why the right read optimization is actually right optimization. Uh, so this is an overview of the talk. Uh, this slide comes from my colleague and professor, Michael Bender, whose wife is a doctor and has the neatest handwriting of any doctor I've ever met. Uh, he has a lot of slides from her, they're nice. Go back? Can you just go back? Oh, sure. Sure. <laughs> um, so here's the actual overview. Uh, we've talked about ways of doing read optimization with indexes. Uh, we've talked about why write optimization is necessary for read optimization. And the rest of the talk, I'll be describing different write optimization techniques. Uh, first, I'll talk about insert batching, which is what uh, OLAP is. Then I'll talk about what I sometimes call bureaucratic insert batching, which is a cute analogy for LSM trees or log structured merge trees. And then finally, we'll talk about how the post office does write optimization. Um, which is what fractal trees are, and that's what our, our database, TokoDB, is based on. Uh, so first, let's, let's talk about the problem again, but I'm going to reformulate it. So the reason why random insertions into a B tree are slow is that disk seeks are very slow, and B trees incur a disk seek for every insert that they perform. But a different way to think about it is that B trees only accomplish one insert for every disk seek that they do. So this leads us to a simpler problem, which is, can we get B trees to do more useful work per disk seek? So let's talk about insert batching. So the first thing you might think to do is, well, sequential insertions are faster than random insertions. Um, this technically holds for empty trees, but even for existing trees, you can gather together a whole bunch of insertions, maybe a day's worth. It depends on the size of your database and how fast you're inserting. But you can bunch them together, then sort them, and you can insert them in sorted order. And when you're inserting a batch of insertions in sorted order, it's faster because you end up with multiple insertions in the same leaf. And this happens a lot in practice, so this technique is pretty much standard practice in a lot of scenarios. It's commonly used in whole app. Um, but let's, let's take a, an example of how, the, how this might work. So typical B3 scenario, a billion rows, each row is 160 bytes, kind of average-ish. Uh, so you have 160 gigabytes of data. Your page size is 16 kilobytes. That's what NODB uses by default. And your machine has 16 gigabytes of main memory. So that means, so each leaf is 16 kilobytes, and you divide that by 160 byte rows, so each leaf has 100 rows. There are going to be 10 million leaves, because 
160 gigabytes over 16 kilobytes is 10 billion. Did I do that right? Yeah. Um, and then, at most, the amount of memory you have over the total size of your data, at most 10% of the leaves fit in, in main memory. So most leaf accesses are going to require a disk C. So let's, let's see if we can get somewhere with insert batching and also see what that means a little bit. So we're going to batch 16 gigabytes of data before we put anything in the tree, before we do any I.O. Um, any I.O. On the, on the B tree. So that's 100 million rows, and that depends how fast your application is generating data, but that could be a while. But once you have 16 gigabytes of data, you're going to sort that data and insert it into the B tree. We've batched 10% of the total data size, and each leaf has 100 rows, remember. So every time we put something in a leaf, we're actually going to put basically 10 insertions into that leaf before we write it out. And we're doing it in sorted order, so we're going to grab a leaf, put the 10 insertions that we have for that leaf in it, and then write it out once. So each disk seek is going to accomplish 10 inserts instead of just one that we normally would have had. And so we get about 10x throughput. But we had to batch a lot of rows to get there. Uh, since these are stored on disk, uh, and they're not indexed, we can't query them very well. And the reason they're stored on disk is, remember, you only had 16 gigabytes of main memory. That's how much you want to batch to get this kind of speed. So you just have to log them to disk. You can't, uh, you can't just buffer them in memory. So these, these rows, while they're being batched, are just sitting on disk, unsorted, and you basically can't touch them with queries for now. And also note, if we had 10 billion rows, which is 1.6 terabytes, we would have had to save a billion inserts just to get the same factor speed up. So this is what OLAP uses. OLAP is basically insert batching um, for some implementations of OLAP. What they do is they batch up a constant fraction of your database size, and then they sort that and they insert it into your database. And it has to be a constant fraction, because otherwise the math doesn't quite work out right. But you can pick a fraction you like, and it'll, it'll pretty much work. The advantage is you get plenty of throughput from a very simple idea. It doesn't take much to actually get this to work. Um, we got 10x in this example, but if you have larger leaves, if you think about it, if you're saving up 10% of your data, and your leaves each have, say, 1,000 rows instead of just 100 rows, then 10% of that is 100 inserts. And so now every disk seek is going to get you 100 times the speed that you normally would have gotten. So if you, if you increase your, your leaves, you might get more throughput out of this. But the disadvantage here is data latency. So your data is going to arrive for insertion. So you're going to perform the insert statement but it's just going to get logged to disk, and it's not actually inserted into your index, so you can't query it until the entire batch is inserted. And the bigger the database, remember, it's got to be this constant fraction of the whole database size to, so that the math works out right. The bigger the database, the bigger the batches need to be, and so you'll experience more and more latency as your database grows. So what can we learn here? Uh, we got latency because our data didn't get indexed right away. It just sat around on disk, wasn't indexed, and without an index, we can't query that data. So we could try indexing that buffer. You know, it's, we're putting data in there, there's some data set, we can try just indexing it. But we need to make sure we don't lose, lose that speed boost. So let's try something. We'll have one main B tree on disk. This will be the same, the normal index that we were using before. We'll have another smaller B tree. This will also be on disk, and that'll count as our index insert buffer. And so we'll, we'll say that this small B tree has a maximum size that's a constant fraction of the main B tree's size. And our inserts first go into the small B tree. And because this B tree is smaller, the inserts go, go in faster. And then when the small B tree gets big enough, we, it's basically already sorted, so you can just merge it sequentially with the larger B tree. And 
when you want to do queries, you have to do a query on both trees, which is a little bit slower than just doing a query on one tree. But at least you can query it all immediately. So it looks like we solved the latency problem. But let's see if we, if we kept that speed boost that we got by having an insert buffer. Well, at first we actually did. Uh, at first, the smaller B tree just fits in memory, so that's fine, and inserts are very fast. But when the, the entire size of the database grows, remember, it's, it's important that you have the smaller tree be a constant fraction of the large B tree's size. So you have to grow the smaller tree, otherwise you lose the throughput boost. And eventually, even the small B tree is too big for memory, and it goes it flows out to disk, and now you're doing random disk I.O just to batch up your inserts before you even insert them into the main dictionary. And so we can't insert even into this small B tree fast enough because it's just not that small anymore. So let's try the same trick again. Okay, we, we have problems inserting into a B tree, so we'll stick an insert buffer in front of it. It doesn't matter that it's the smaller one. But now you have data latency, so let's try indexing that new buffer and we'll continue doing this. And so we recurse on this idea of having an insert buffer and then indexing that insert buffer. And this brings us quite neatly into the next write optimization, um, which is an LSM tree. So this is what I called a log structure merge tree. Uh, I think the paper was in like 96-ish. Um, it's basically a generalization of the OLAP technique of, of insert batching. So, Instead of just having one B tree on disk and then an insert buffer, we're going to have a hierarchy of B trees. So we'll have B0, B1, B2, and if you want to think about it in a certain way, you can say that B sub K is going to be the insert buffer for BK plus 1. So we'll also say that the maximum size of BK plus 1 is twice that of BK. So maybe B0 has a maximum size of 1, and B1 has a maximum size of 2, and B2 has a maximum size of 4, and so on. Uh, the, the word twice is just makes our example simpler, but doesn't have to be fixed. You can have it be 10 times if you want. And when B sub K gets full, reaches its maximum size, we're going to merge it down to BK plus 1. And this is a sequential insertion into BK plus 1. So that's fast. And then we'll have dbk. And these merges can cascade down multiple levels. Suppose you, you, know, you, you take uh, b0 and you merge it down to b1. And so now b1 has the size that b0 had. And then b0 fills up again, so you merge it down. And now b1 is full as well, so then you merge that down. So these cascade things can happen. But this is called the log structure merge tree. So to visualize it, uh, the way we're going to treat B trees uh, makes them look a lot like arrays in memory. Um, if we simplify things a tiny bit, really the only thing we're going to do with our data is merging B trees. And that's fast, right? It's all sequential I.O. And it's fast for pretty much the same reason that merging sorted arrays is fast in memory. And that's why merge sort is fast. So these are we can, we can think about, B -tree, about the B trees in our hierarchy as just being arrays, and that makes it a little easier to visualize. So here's a, a potential LSM tree. The way it works out is that you, you can set this up so that every level is either going to be completely empty or completely full. And that helps the proofs a bit, but it doesn't really matter right now. But this is what it'll look like. You'll have each level being twice as large as the last one. And each level may or may not have a certain amount of data in it. So B sub K is maximum size. In this case, it's 2 to the K, but it might be 10 to the K or something else. Um, you can actually just, if you want, pick certain values. It doesn't have to exactly double. And the first few levels are just going to be in memory. Uh, if you have N memory, it's like log of N levels are going to be in memory. And so let's see how this works. So we start out with a completely empty LSM tree up here. And we want to insert 17. So we go to the first level, and we say, oh, that's empty, so I can just put 17 there. 
good, done. Now we want to insert 12, but we can't insert it into the first level because that's full. So we're going to try to merge both of these elements into the second level. And so we do that, and then we empty the first level. Then we only insert 23, and we can't because the first level is empty, so we do it. Then we want to insert 30, so we look in the first level. We can't because that's full. So we try merging 30 and 23 into the second level, but we can't because that's also full. So now we try merging all four of these into the, second, into the third level, and that works. So we merge it, and now this is the state of our LSM tree. And eventually we'll have enough data that the first three levels are full, we want to insert something else. And in this case, we've merged all of the data we have so far down one more level. And this is how insertions go in an LSM tree. So it's whenever you have data, you plop it in the first one, and then everything else just is these cascading flushes that go down the tree. So LSM tree insertion performance is pretty good. Uh, they use I.O. very efficiently. Remember, if we have uh, each level doubling in size, every time we merge, we're going to be putting 50% of the receiving tree's size into that tree. So each disk seek done during a merge accomplishes half as many inserts as fit in that page. So if one page fits 100 elements, when you merge into it, you're merging 50 elements on average into that page. And so it, that, that was the numbers from the early example. And that's going to end up being 50 inserts per disk seat. So every time we merge, we're doing it 50 times faster than if we had inserted our elements one by one into that level. But there's a certain number of, level, of those levels that are on disk. It happens to be a log of your total amount of data minus log of your size of memory. But the point is that you have all these levels, and some of them are on disk. All the larger ones are generally on disk. And each insert, each actual row that you're putting into the database, needs to get written at some point to each one of these levels. So it needs to get written. You actually have to do I.O. for that insert that many times. In the example I had earlier, it was about three of those levels were on disk. So your, each insert accounts for actually three I.O.s. But overall, we win because the boost we get from batching our inserts, remember that was like 50, well overwhelms the pain of writing it multiple times, which is like, you know, we had to write three times. So this specific example we had earlier, if we put it in an LSM tree that looked like what I described, um, we're going to get about a 16x throughput boost. So that's awesome. Uh, LSM trees have very, very, very good insert performance. And their query performance suffers a little bit. Uh, remember, you know, they have no data latency. You can query as soon as the data is in there. But they're going to do a full B-tree search once for each level. So you fill up an LSM tree, and now you're looking for the number 30. You're going to have to go to every level in succession and look for 30 until you find it. And B-tree searches are about as fast as they get, but they are going to incur at least one disk seek once you get to the levels that are all on disk. And so LSM trees end up doing lots of B tree searches, each one accounting for at least one random disk I.O. And so queries in LSM trees are much slower than in B trees. Uh, they end up being a factor of log n slower. Um, and log n could be two or three, or it could be 10. So your queries in large database cases, they're going to get a lot slower because you're going to have a lot of levels on disk. So what did we get from LSM trees? Well, we solved the latency problem. The data is available for query immediately. And we solved the insertion problem. The insertions are really, really fast. But the queries take a nasty hit. They're just not as fast as they were with B trees. So it's not really what we want. Uh, they're almost there. They can keep up with large data sets, uh, having multiple secondary indexes and high insertion rates. Uh, Google, their level DB, I think it came out like last year, they use LSM trees. They can keep up with very high insertion rates on large data sets, but the indexes that they keep are just not as effective for queries. 
Um, so we lost some of the rate optimization that we would have gotten by keeping these, these indexes. So this brings me to the last rate optimization, which is what we do. So we call them fractal trees. Um, and fractal trees kind of get the, boast of the, the best of both worlds. So remember, LSM trees are going to have this one big structure, B tree, for each level. And that means you need to do a global search on every level for what you want. And that, that global search can be slow. Uh, B trees, by comparison, they have many smaller structures in each level. Those are the nodes in your tree. And uh, so when you do a tree traversal on the B tree, at every level, you do a very small amount of work. You look at one page. Whereas with LSM trees, you have to look at all of the data, roughly. I mean, you, you don't do a full scan, but you have to actually go through all of the data somehow. With a fractal tree, you get the best of both worlds. Topologically, it's going to look like a B tree. It has fan out, and um, you have parents and multiple children. But it also buffers like an LSM tree. So searches are going to be fast because of its topology, and inserts are going to be fast because of its buffering. So let's see how we build this. Start with just a general B tree. Uh, for those of you that don't know, B tree, you start with one node at the top, the root node, and it has a B children. So B could be like 500 children or something. Um, and then each of those children uh, has more children and so on. And when you're looking for data, you go to a node and you figure out where what I'm looking for would be in this in this node, and then you go to the proper child, and you get to the leaf node, and you find the data you want. So you're going to start with one of those, but now you're going to put an unindexed buffer of size b. So in our case, it's four megabytes. It could be 16 kilobytes or something. We put this buffer at each node, and because these buffers are small, they're not gigabytes. Um, they don't introduce data latency. So the insertions are going to go to the root node's buffer. You only have like a thousand inserts in the root node. But when a buffer gets full, you're going to flush it down the tree. And what that means is you're going to walk through the buffer and figure out where in the tree each of those elements needs to go. And you'll put it just one level down into the buffer in the child. And this, you know, in the same way that an LSM trees merges can cascade, this can cause fractal tree merges to cascade. You may flush into a child buffer and make that child full and then have to flush again. But it's a similar buffering technique. Um, and so when you're searching, when you go down the tree and you're, you're traversing trying to find the data that you want, you're actually going to look at each buffer along the way. And the point here is that they can ignore, when you're doing a search, you can ignore all the rest of the data at that depth in the tree. So when you have an LSM tree, you're going to go down each level, and you're going to do a full B tree search. But when you're searching a fractal tree, you look at like four megabytes of data at most at each level. And so this is a constant amount of work per level. And so we don't end up with that extra factor of log n work. Um, so let's talk about the insertion performance. This will be a little bit mathy, but hopefully not too painful. Uh, the cost to flush a buffer in terms of disk seeks. Well, you have to get that buffer off disk, and then you have to flush it to a constant number of children. And so that's order one disk seeks. It's a constant number of disk seeks. But the cost to flush a buffer per element, remember each buffer holds B elements. You just divide it by B, and the cost to flush a buffer that you attribute to each element in the buffer is 1 over b. That's because you move b elements down the tree when you flush one. And then the number of times an element will get flushed is the same as the number of times that it will get written in an LSM tree, and that's log n. That's just how tall the tree is. Um, and so the total cost to flush an element all the way down is going to be the number of times you flush log n times the cost to actually flush it each time, which overall is only 1 over b. And so 
to actually do an insertion of one element into a fractal tree over time is only log n over b. And by comparison, b tree insertions are actually log n over log b, which is a lot larger. So our cost to, flood, to, to insert an element can be um, can be a very small fraction of like one disk seek because it gets amortized over the cost of a lot of insertions. Whereas the B tree is always going to do at least one disk seek. So fractal trees have very good insertion performance. Um, asymptotically, they're as good as LSM trees. Now let's talk about query performance. Well, fractal tree searches are the same as B tree insertions. Um, because it looks like a B tree, you're going to traverse it like a B tree, and you're going to do the same number of disk seeks as you would with a regular B tree. Now, it does take a little bit more CPU to look at the buffers, but CPU is pretty much free when you're doing uh, analysis of large data sets. So, the CPU that it takes to do that is really not going to matter because the time you spend searching a database is by and large dominated by the number of disk seeks. And there are some choices here that you need to make about how where, like how many buffers you take and how you exactly flush them and how they cascade. And those affect uh, how how well your cache performs and uh, it kind of depends on what workloads you expect, but they don't affect the asymptotics. And so overall fractal trees have great query performance. And it's actually the same as B tree with some different consonants. But. So the advantages are that insertion performance is great and query performance is great. So going back to the beginning of the talk, this allows us to keep all the indexes we need. And it makes sure that our indexes are going to be as effective as they were when we were using B trees. So kind of seems like we won. Um, we can do the read optimization we want by keeping all the indexes we want, and they're going to work great. There are a couple of weird disadvantages. Uh, because you have data at multiple levels of the tree, which is different from a B tree, uh, there's some dependence between tree nodes, which, which can make concurrency a little bit trickier when you're trying to implement one. Um, and then there's this interesting insertion search imbalance, where insertions are very, very, very cheap. But searches are still as expensive as they were with a B tree. It still costs at least one disk I/O to search a fractal tree because your data just might not be in memory and you need to respond immediately. You can't defer the action of the search. So searches are more expensive. And when you're using SQL, if you have a unique index, when you go to do an insert, it actually needs to go do a search and see if that data is there so it can tell you, oh no, that insert isn't going to work out you have a unique index and there's already something there. So in some cases, you may have to watch out for these um, because you know, you'll know you be trying to evaluate our, our database and you'll say, oh, my inserts didn't get any faster. And the reason is because, well, your inserts are actually searches and you need to do a little bit of thinking about how you can remove that uniqueness constraint. Um, we also get some other benefits. Uh, because we're always doing sequential I.O. and we've batched all of our inserts, we can afford to increase the block size from like 16K to about four megabytes. And that reduces fragmentation that you might see in an aging B tree. Um, so your range scans will always be fast. And because the block size is larger, uh, compression algorithms can take advantage of that and actually get much, much better compression. Uh, we've seen like 30X compression on some workloads. Could be more, could be less. It all depends on what kind of data you're storing. And you can play these interesting tricks with uh, messages. So the way, the way we do it is when you want to insert something, remember we're going to put something into a buffer? Well, we call that a message. And a message doesn't necessarily just have to be data. It could be delete this element, or it could be a sort of message that goes to every leaf in the tree and updates every single row. And so you could implement updates this way, uh, you can do hot column addition or uh, hot optimize table uh, to sort of force work to happen. Um, we can also do hot indexing, but that's a little bit of a separate thing. 
Um, but it lets you do sort of these online DDL things. Uh, if you were to implement your own fractal tree, you could implement sort of arbitrary messages that go down and when they get applied, they maybe add one to every row or something. So you could do updates this way. Uh, so there's some pretty cool tricks you can play with that. And uh, that's about it. Um, so thanks. Uh, we have a booth and we have a lightning talk coming up later that's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, I suppose I'm open for questions. I think we have about five minutes left. That's correct. Um, basically, an insert into a unique dictionary is a search. You need to go and find that data if it's there. So you really just have to engineer around that a little bit. Um, the advantage we get from insertions is basically lost because you, I mean you can prove there's a lower bound on how fast you can search in external memory. So you're just never going to get faster than that um, for searches. So if you if you do have a unique index, that search cost is going to dominate your insertions. Oh yes, we have an implementation. Uh, we're passing out a uh, little frisbees. Uh, we we implement a uh, storage engine for MySQL that you can plug in instead of MongoDB and try it out. Um, and if you're interested, you can come to our booth and we can talk about how you evaluate that. So when you implement this kind of thing, you when you when you split a node, yeah. yeah. And then the middle guy you So when the split happens, it does the in the token in the faculty does it sort the elements then choose the middle element or is it? I think the way we do it is we pick the maximum value of the left subtree. But it's not too important. Yeah. And what you actually end up having to do is when we have this buffer that might have some stuff in it. You have to flush that buffer, and then you can split the node without worrying about it. Yeah, this is very um, simple. Um, the buffer that you keep around is it just a sequential scan of that? It's. Um, you can actually just look there, do the normal B tree thing, and also look at this Well, that, remember I said there's some design decisions around this that you have to make. Um, one way you can do it is when you're doing a search, you get to a node. First, you look through the buffer sequentially, and it's, it's a memory, so whatever, it's not too bad. And then, if you don't find it, you look at your pivot key to go the proper way, and you get the next one. Um, another thing you might do is your search could like force everything down that path to flush, so that when, you, when you're doing your search, you're going to get to a sequence of nodes, and every time you're going to force it to flush down, so that you don't actually have to search any buffers, but when you get to the bottom, all of your data will be there and you just do the search there. The problem with that is that your searches are inducing disk I.O. And so we actually do something sort of in the middle and you know, it, it, it's complicated. You have to make some choices. Um, but overall it doesn't affect the asymptotics. It's just how you want to do it and how you want to behave in the face of certain workloads. Yeah, that's Oh, and then you free just rehash everything, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it's, it, it, so we can we can do range codes, basically. Hash tables, calculus. Not, 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 but in the double down tree, how do you have a full table scan with the double You have to do a full table scan in every tree, and then you have to sort the results later. So that's a little bit rough. Uh, full I mean, table, that, that's full what Full table scans are always rough, so. Yeah, it's a lot quicker. So our, our nodes are like four megabytes. So instead of doing, you know, in a B tree, you have thousands of leaf nodes, and each one is going to be a like, you know, random IO. Um, when you have much larger leaves, you have just have fewer leaf nodes, so you do fewer disk seeds, and our range scans are actually pretty good. The comment was then you have to pay when you have to rebalance the B tree. Right. With bigger leaves. With bigger leaves. Yeah. But you know, 
Yes, yeah, so that, that, I mean, that's pay at some point. To it. Like some people like Sybase use really big leaves, but that's because they're not optimizing for insertion. Okay.